Bonjour and welcome to Breaking Down Bad Books, a podcast analysing trashy bestsellers from a literary perspective. And today we're looking at chapters 20, 21 and 22 of The Da Vinci Code. So where we left off... Robert and Sophie met in the bathrooms of the Grand Gallery of the Louvre and she was like, you're being tracked. And he's like, no, I'm not. And then she's like, actually, you are. Long story short, there was a tracker in his pocket. And so then she put that in a bar of soap and then she threw it out the window, which landed into a truck, which happened to be parked outside of the window. And then it's speeding across. And so then all the cops in the Louvre abandoned ship. And so now he's escaping the Louvre because she told him that Fash has got it out for him. And also Silas rocked up to a church finally. So we start chapter 20 with emerging from the shadows, Langdon and Sophie moved stealthily up the deserted Grand Gallery corridor toward the emergency exit stairwell. Okay, well, if it's deserted, why do you have to move stealthily at all? And can it really be considered deserted if there's a human being lying dead on the floor in the middle of the gallery. I wouldn't call it deserted. And so Langdon, he's trying to process everything that's just happened. And he's thinking, what? The captain of the judicial police, the DCPJ, is trying to frame me for murder? I don't know if we ever said frame. I don't know where that's coming from. Your name was written on the floor. You're implicated. You're a suspect. There's no framing going on. Just because he thinks it's you doesn't mean that he's framing you. And he's thinking, I think he's framed me for murder. (laughs) And then he goes to Sophie, hey, do you think that maybe Fash wrote that message on the floor? And Sophie's like, what? What? No. She says, impossible. Impossible. Where the fuck have you been, Robert? There's all these detailed connections to my past, my history with him him as my grandfather, me as a granddaughter, all these secret little messages. No, Fash didn't write that down. Why would Fash do that? And Langdon wasn't so sure. And he says, he seems pretty intent on making me look guilty. Maybe he thought writing my name on the floor would help his case. Why would he even think of you? Why would he ever do that, Robert? And Sophie's like, look, mate, the Fibonacci sequence, the PS, the Da Vinci, the goddess symbolism, that was my granddad. And he's like, yeah, I suppose. He says, the symbolism of the clues meshed too perfectly. The pentacle, the Vitruvian man, Da Vinci, the goddess, even the Fibonacci sequence, a coherent symbolic set, as iconographers would call it. And Langdon's just trying to think it through and he's like, oh, draconian devil, oh, lame saint. Still sounds pretty odd to me. He's like, I don't get it. And also Dan Brown reminds us of the stakes. His fake leap out the bathroom was not going to help Langdon's popularity with Fash one bit. Somehow he doubted the captain of the French police would see the humour in chasing down and arresting a bar of soap. That feels just plopped in there. I don't know why we're being reminded of the soap incident. And then we're just back to the mystery at hand. And Langdon says, do you think there's a possibility that the numbers in your grandfather's message hold the key to understanding the other lines? Spoiler alert, of course they do. And he's talking to like a cryptographer and she's like, well, I have considered it. Like no fucking shit, she's considered it. But she says, I don't see it. It's cryptographic gibberish. And he says, but they're part of the Fibonacci sequence. It can't be a coincidence. And she says, it's not. Fibonacci was my favorite. You know, everything's always her favorite. Growing up, it's a, it's a reference to me growing up because I once mentioned that I like the Fibonacci sequence. She says, the Fibonacci numbers were my grandfather's way of waving another flag at me, like writing the message in English or arranging himself like my favorite piece of art or drawing a pentacle on himself. All of it was to catch my attention. God, she is so self-centered. He called you that day. Wasn't that enough? He said, meet me at the Louvre. We're in grave danger. I've got to tell you about your family history. And she's like, I suspect he's trying to show me something. Yeah, he was trying to tell you something. And she's just like narrowed in on all of those things, just meaning her. And it's like, expand your horizon, Soph. They could mean other things. And Langdon, he's like, oh, so the pentacle has meaning to you. And she goes, yes, I didn't tell you this, but the pentacle was a special symbol between my grandfather and me when I was growing up. Of course it fucking was. Of course it was. What kind of child is getting raised with pentacles? I, uh, uh, if I were child services, I would have dragged that kid out of that house, no matter if he was having a sex orgy or not, that, regardless of that. 
but all of the pentacles and the crosswords and the anagrams, it's, uh, uh, no, let the kid play PlayStation. Let her go outside and ride a bike. Stop making it solve riddles. And she says, we used to play tarot cards for fun. And my indicator card always turned out to be from the suit of pentacles. I'm sure he stacked the deck, but pentacles got to be our little joke. Say, no, you shouldn't be joking with a six-year-old girl about pentacles. And Langdon felt a chill. He says, they played tarot. And also like, yeah, what are you doing playing tarot cards? I mean, go play, go fish. Play snap. If you're going to play cards, play proper card games. She's a kid. And so because it's a Dan Brown book, of course, we've got to get the backstory on tarot. He's got to tell us all about tarot cards. Ugh. The medieval Italian card game was so, g- game was so replete with hidden heretical symbolism that Langdon had dedicated an entire chapter in his new manuscript to the tarot. Originally, tarot had been devised as a secret means to pass along ideologies banned by the church. Now, tarot's mystical qualities were passed on by modern fortune tellers. And then he's going on about the f- feminine divinity of pentacles and the, f- uh, and the tarot cards. Oh, it's all too much. And Langdon's thinking like, okay, so the tarot indicator suit for divinity is pentacles. So if he's stacking pentacles into her tarot deck for fun, then that must mean that pentacles is an inside joke. Why, why is he stacking her tarot deck, by the way? That sort of defeats the purpose. You can't rig a tarot. Oh, this is also stupid. Okay. So they're in the emergency stairwell. They're trying to flee the Louvre. But Langdon, he's onto something. So he says, hey, your grandfather, when he told you about the pentacle, did he mention goddess worship or any resentment of the Catholic church? She says, nah, I was more interested in the mathematics of it. The divine proportion, phi, that's P-H-I, I believe it's pronounced phi, Fibonacci sequences, that sort of thing. And Langdon's like, wow, your grandfather taught you about the number phi? And she goes, of course, the divine proportion. In fact, he used to joke that I was half divine, you know, because of the letters in my name. And Langdon's like, what? What the hell? Oh, and then he groans. It says Langdon considered it a moment and then groaned. He's like, oh, because P-H-I is in your name. Your name's so Fee. Fee is the no. Oh, that's hilarious. Took him so long to figure it out. But he's like, oh, yeah, got me there. And this is what I'm talking about. She didn't have a normal childhood. She probably just wanted to go home and watch the Cartoon Network or MTV. And he's like, let's sit down and talk about Fee. It's this number. And apparently it's divine. And she was probably thinking, oh, for fuck's sake. Let me watch Clueless. And so then Langdon, he's now got to think about Fee. It says still descending the stairs, Langdon refocused on Fee. He was starting to realize that Sonia's clues were even more consistent than he had first imagined. Da Vinci, Fibonacci numbers, the pentacle. Incredibly, all of these things were connected by a single concept so fundamental to art history that Langdon often spent several class periods on the topic. Fee, oh. Maybe he should have just written fee on the fucking ground if it's so fucking important. And so then we're flashing back. Oh, we're flashing back to an art lecture. Okay, so he's back at Harvard standing in front of his symbolism in art class and he's writing his favorite number on the chalkboard. A chalkboard, Harvard? Can you not upgrade to a whiteboard with markers or a smart board or something, Harvard? You're using chalk. You're using chalk. Ugh. So the, the favorite number of his, his favorite number in the world is 1.618. Like, oh my God. you know what's a good number? Four. You know what's a great number? 69. Like, just keep it simple, Langdon. Whose favorite number is 1.618? What a tosser. And so Langdon, he's like, hey, students, what do you reckon this number is? Can anyone tell me what this number is? And it's like, ah, uh, the answer is 1.618, toss pot. But then one long-legged math major, good to know he's long-legged, good for him. And he says, that's the number fee. And then it says he pronounced it fee, F-E-E. That's how I, pro- am I pronouncing it wrong, Robert? Like, wh- can, you, can you tell me how it's meant to be pronounced? Cause I'm just gonna keep saying fee. I think it's fee, cause it's not pie. It could be fi. Fee, fi, fo, fum. Shove your favorite number up your bum. And so then Langdon says, everybody meet fee. <laughs> And then this long-legged boy, he says, not to be confused with pi, as we mathematicians like to say, phi is one h of a lot cooler than pi. Now that's a lame joke, isn't it? And Langdon laughed, but no one else seemed to get the joke. Like, very generous to call it a joke. That's not funny. 
And so Langdon says 1.618. It's a very important number in art. Who can tell me why? And so this long-legged kid, he says, because it's so pretty. And he goes, actually, you're right. (gasps) He says, phi is generally considered the most beautiful number in the universe. Or just generally considered. I don't know if there was like a People's Magazine hottest number in the world, but. uh, And the laughter abruptly stopped. Because they're all like, what? He's being serious. (gasps) And so then he loads up his slide projector. A slide projector. He's using chalk and he's using slide projectors. Oh, can we get some funding for Harvard? Is Harvard on the brink of collapse or something? Like, let's get them some technology. So the number phi was derived from the Fibonacci sequence. I don't know if that's a coincidence. A progression famous. Remember, everything's famous. Famous not only because of the sum of adjacent terms equaled the next term, but because of the quotients of adjacent terms possess the astonishing property of approaching the number 1.618. Fee, okay, that that means nothing to me. (laughs) Whew, went right over my head. I've got a literature degree, not a maths degree. So then Langdon's going on about how the truly mind boggling aspect of fee was its role as a fundamental building block in nature. Plants, animals, and even human beings all possess dimensional properties that adhered with eerie exactitude to the ratio of Phi to one. I don't give it. Uh, uh. And he says, Phi's ubiquity in nature clearly exceeds coincidence. And so the ancients assumed the number Phi must have been preordained by the creator of the universe. Why, well, as if early scientists herald 1.618 as the divine proportion. <sighs> and so then some woman in the front right, she says, uh, hold on, pops. I'm a bio major. And I've never seen the divine proportion in nature. She's like, gotcha there, Robert Langdon, who's literally teaching a whole subject on the divine proportion. I'm going to correct you. I'm going to fact check you, Robert Langdon. And so Langdon's like, bring it on. And he says, oh, really? Well, have you ever studied the relationship between females and males in a honeybee community? And she goes, sure. Like, obviously, like, duh, I'm a bio major. So obviously I study bees. She's like, of course I fucking have, stupid Robert Langdon. Bees were my major in high school, like, uh. And she says, the female bees always outnumber the male bees, de doy. And he goes, yeah, you're right about that. But did you know that if you divide the number of female bees by the number of male bees in any beehive in the world, you always get the same number? And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah. And she goes, no way. And he goes, way. Like, did we just stumble into like the Californian skit? Like, what, what, what am I, what am I reading? We just went all full valley girl. Like, where? Nowhere. Yeah, where? Do you want to go to the mall? Yeah, let's go to the mall and talk about bears. So then they're looking at some other bullshit crap in nature that apparently gets divided and it comes down to 1.618. I still think it's a coincidence. He's showing a sunflower seed growing in opposing spirals. The ratio of each rotation's diameter to the next is phi. Everyone's like, holy shit. That proves it. That proves everything. There was a sunflower seed and something about a ratio of something angles or some bullshit. I'm not buying it. I know it's a real thing because I Googled it trying to fact check this stupid book, but I'm still not buying it. So then they're looking at pine cones, leaves, insect segmentation, all displaying astonishing obedience to the divine proportion. And so then someone's shouting out going, this is amazing. He's always got such an interactive class, doesn't he? Someone at the back's just saying, this is amazing, keep going. And someone else yells out and says, yeah, but what does it have to do with art? And Langdon says, aha, glad you asked, as if he wasn't prepared for that because the whole subject is meant to be about that. And he goes, all right, here's a picture of Leonardo da Vinci's famous male nude, the Vitruvian Man. And and now we're getting the backstory in the Vitruvian Man. I thought we've covered it. I thought we already knew everything we needed to know about that stupid fucking sketch. Oh, but now he's telling us it's named for Marcus Vitruvius, the brilliant Roman architect who praised the divine proportion in his text, De Architectura. And then he's telling us, nobody understood better than da Vinci, the divine structure of the human body. Da Vinci exhumed corpses to measure the proportions of human bone structure, blah, 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 blah. He found that the human body is literally made of building blocks whose proportional ratios always equal phi. Okay, I don't know if we're literally made of building blocks. We're not made of Legos. And so then everyone in class gave him a dubious look. Everyone, even though they just got shown all of the proof about 
oh, this freaking number in ratios in the natural world. They're all like, uh, the human body, and that's a step too far. And Langdon says, don't believe me. Next time you're in the shower, take a tape measure. And so then, of course, like a couple of the football players snickered. I love that the football players are just taking this symbology subject. They'll probably think, and this is going to be an easy class. The lecturer just talks shit with his slide projector for an hour and then we can go home. Langdon says, not just you, you insecure jocks. All of you, guys and girls, try it. Measure the distance from the tip of your head to the floor, then divide that by the distance from your belly button to the floor. Guess what number you get? All right, yeah, okay, I get the challenge you're giving them, but why did you say that they have to do that in the shower with a tape measure? They can do that anywhere. They can do that with clothes on. What a bizarre thing to say. You can't go telling a bunch of students, your students, to go and get naked and measure themselves. You could do that right now. You don't have to bring showering into this. Also, it seems dangerous. If you try to measure things in the shower, you'll probably slip. And so he says, yeah, guess what number you get? And one of the jocks goes, not fee, surely not. He's like tearing his hair out. He's like, I can't believe it. And Langdon says, yes, fee. No way, yes way. Fee, yes fee. He says 1.618. Like, okay, we know the number by now, but all right. He's never actually told us why we say fee instead of 1.618. That's the explanation I want. But no, we keep going. So the distance from your shoulder to your fingertips, your elbow to your fingertips, your knees to the floor, finger joints, toes, spinal divisions, they all, they all do something and they come down to fee. And Langdon could tell that they were all astounded and he felt a familiar warmth inside, like, oh, this is why I teach. To astound people about, I don't know, the divisions of their knee bones. I I don't care. He says, my friends, as you can see, the chaos of the world has an underlying order. Or, okay, well, does it? I mean, (laughs) when the ancients discovered Fi, they were certain they had stumbled across God's building block for the world. And they worshipped nature because of, how, how bored were these ancients that we're talking about? Were they just lying around all day being like, oh, I'm bored. Let's, let's count bees. Let's draw some segmentations in some leaves. Yeah, I'm so bored. So God's hand is evident in nature. And even to this day, there exist pagan mother earth revering religions. Many of us celebrate nature the way the pagans did and don't even know it. <gasps> He's going to drop another bomb. And he says, May Day is a perfect example the celebration of spring, the earth coming back to life to produce her bounty. And I'm like, okay, well, not in the Southern Hemisphere, mate. We don't have May Day here and it's not about spring because we'll be coming into bloody autumn. Maybe the ancients only lived in the Northern Hemisphere. Who knows? So then he said, art is man's attempt to imitate the beauty of the creator's hand in nature, blah, blah, bullshit, blah. And over the next half hour, Langdon showed them slides of artwork by Michelangelo, Da Vinci, bunch of other people. It's also in buildings. It's in pyramids. It's in the Parthenon. It's at the UN building. Uh, Fee appears in sonatas and symphonies and all this crap. Apparently Fee is just everywhere. I don't know if you've gotten that point yet, but Fee is everywhere. And like, we're in the middle of a murder mystery and we've just spent five fucking pages talking about this stupid number. It's not even one of the numbers that was written on the floor. Get over it. But he's got a, we're still in the lecture. We're still in the lecture flashback. And he says, in closing, we return to symbols. And he draws the pentacle. And he says, this is one of the most powerful images you'll ever see because all of the sides add up to the bloody fee number or something or other. Oh, we're just going on about pentacles too much. So Langdon, he's like, can anyone tell me why the pentacle is such an important symbol? And the long-legged guy, he says, because if you draw a pentagram, the lines automatically divide themselves into segments according to the divine proportion. And Langdon gave the kid a proud nod and said, nice job. Like, of course, that was so freaking obvious. Everything that he's mentioned came back down to the divine proportion. And so the last question he asks being like, oh, can anyone say why this is important? Like, I I think you could take a stab at it and say, oh, has it got to do with the divine proportion? And here he is nodding, giving the kid a proud nod, like, oh, calm down. And he says, <laughs> the pentacle is the ultimate expression of the divine proportion, blah, blah, blah. The five pointed star has always been the symbol for beauty and perfection associated with the goddess and the sacred feminine. And apparently all the girls in class beamed because I don't know, they're like, 
flattered that pentacles is something to do with the sacred family. I, 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 I doubt the girls are beaming, Robert. And then he says, also, we only talked about Da Vinci briefly, but we'll be seeing a lot more of him this semester. Leonardo was a well-documented devotee of the ancient ways of the goddess. Tomorrow, I'll show you his fresco, The Last Supper, which is one of the most astonishing tributes to the sacred feminine you will ever see. And some kid says, you're kidding, right? You're kidding. They always are so skeptical of a teacher in their classroom. When I was at university, I was never questioning a teacher being like, are you bullshitting me? That sounds ridiculous. And he says, yeah, there are symbols hidden in places you would never imagine. And then we're back in the present. Thank God we got all that context. And Sophie's like, come on, we got to hurry. And Langdon's like, what? I've just had this memory about Da Vinci. Like, haven't we been thinking about Da Vinci the whole fucking time? And he goes, oh, oh, O oh, Draconian devil, O oh, lame saint. And he's like, oh my God, it can't be that simple. It says there in the bowels of the Louvre. Okay, do we have to say bowels of the Louvre? Can you just say the basement, the stairwell? I mean, you're not in the bowels of anything. I don't, I don't like that expression. There in the bowels of the Louvre with images of Fee and Da Vinci swirling through his mind. Robert Langdon suddenly and unexpectedly deciphered Sonia's code. And he keeps saying, oh, I've got it. Oh, of course. Oh, it's such a simple code. And Sophie's like, can you fill a bitch in? And Langdon says, you said it yourself. The Fibonacci numbers only have meaning in their proper order. Otherwise they're gibberish. And so she's like, what? What are you talking? So she pulls out the printout of the numbers and she's staring at it. And he says, the scrambled Fibonacci sequence is a clue. The numbers are a hint to how to decipher the rest of the message. And he's just really over explaining what an anagram is. He could have just said, it's an anagram. And she would have figured it out because she's a cryptologist. It's like literally her job to like solve anagrams and puzzles and shit. And he's like, what you need to see is he wrote the sequence out of order to tell us to apply the same concept to the text. O oh, draconian devil, O oh, lame saint, those lines mean nothing. They are simply letters written out of order. Yeah, just say anagrams. We, n- we know what an anagram is. And so then Sophie's processing it. And then she's like, oh my God, you think the message is an anagram, right? And okay, yep, yeah, she's figured it out. But now Dan Brown needs to tell us what an anagram is apparently. And she goes, like a word jumble from the newspaper. And Langdon's like, oh, Few people realise that anagrams, despite being a trite modern amusement, had a rich history of sacred symbolism. Of course they fucking did. (gasps) Of course they did. Oh, few people realised. Jeez Louise. And so now he's got to go into the history of anagrams. The mystical teachings of the Kabbalah drew heavily on anagrams. French kings throughout the Renaissance were so convinced that anagrams held magic power, they appointed royal anagrammatists to help them make better decisions. Oh. The Romans referred to the study of anagrams as Ars Magna, which is referred to as the great art, which is coincidentally an anagram of the word anagram. And he says, your grandfather's meaning was right in front of us all along. And he left us more than enough clues to see it. And then he pulls out a pen just out of nowhere, miraculously, and he rearranges the letters. O draconian devil, O lame saint was a perfect anagram. An anagram. Oh, an anagram. What does an anagram mean? Of Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa. And that's the end of that chapter. Far out. Oh, we went a long way for an anagram reveal, didn't we? Especially because it was obvious from 18 chapters ago, but okay. Oh, we got the anagram reveal. All right, at least we're getting somewhere. We're on to the Mona Lisa. Let's start chapter 21. And chapter 21 starts with the line, the Mona Lisa. And I'm like, yes, finally work, bitch. And Sophie's feeling shocked by the anagram reveal, but also a little embarrassed that she didn't figure it out herself. And I'm like, yeah, you should be. You should march into the cryptography department tomorrow morning and hand in your letter of resignation because that's freaking shameful. But she's trying to justify it. It says, Sophie's expertise in complex cryptanalysis had caused her to overlook simplistic word games. And yet she knew she should have seen it. After all, she was no stranger to anagrams, especially in English. Okay, so now we've got to have a flashback for her and how she discovered anagrams, her personal history with anagrams. Jeez Louise. So when she was young, often her grandfather would use anagram games to hone her English spelling. Of course he did. Heaven forbid she play with a ball. Once he had written the English word planets 
and told Sophie that an astonishing 62 other English words of varying lengths could be formed using those same letters. Yeah, anagrams. Okay. Sophie had spent three days with an English dictionary until she found them all. Okay, well, that feels like cheating. That feels like cheating to use a dictionary. And if you're using a cheating tool, like an English dictionary, why is it taking you three days? Wait till Sophie finds out what Wordle is. It'll blow her mind. She will be mind blown. And Langdon says, I can't imagine how your grandfather created such an intricate anagram in the minutes before he died. And she's like, oh, well, you know what? This is embarrassing. (laughs) This is embarrassing. But actually, my grandfather was a wordplay aficionado and an art lover. And he had entertained himself as a young man by creating anagrams of famous works of art. Oh God, that's sad though, isn't it? Like get a girlfriend, get a boyfriend, have a wank even like, oh, it's so sad. And also if he was known to like have this habit, you'd think you would have cottoned on a bit sooner, Soph. That's kind of embarrassing. And so apparently like this quirk of his was so renowned, it even got him into trouble once because he had once called Picasso's masterpiece Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, a perfect anagram of vile, meaningless doodles. And Picasso fans were not amused. And if there's one thing you want to do, it's not piss off Picasso fans. And so now she's thinking he probably created this Mona Lisa anagram long ago, and now he's pointing us towards the Mona Lisa. She says why his final words to her reference the famous painting, Sophie had no idea, but she could think of only one possibility, a disturbing one. Being that they are not his final words and there's a secret message hidden on the Mona Lisa. And she's like, but that's crazy, right? And then she's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. The Mona Lisa, we're in the Louvre. The Mona Lisa's around the corner. Oh my God. And he would have been within reach of the Mona Lisa. That's crazy. It's like, did you forget that you were in the Louvre, doll? And she's got to lay it out for us a million fucking times. She says, he could have easily visited the Mona Lisa before he died. Yeah. Famously, he's in the Louvre, where he died, undistood. And you think we'd just like, you know, take her word for it that the Mona Lisa is in the gallery or like we would also figure out that the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. Like, you know, we're not dummies, but no, she's got to then have a flashback to explain how she knows that the Mona Lisa is in the Louvre. As Sophie recalled her first childhood visit to the Denon Wing, she realised that if her grandfather had a secret to tell her, Few places on earth made a more apt rendezvous than Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Few places on earth were a more appropriate place for them to meet up than the Mona Lisa. How about just going to a cafe for a chat? Or his apartment, your apartment. Oh, there's nowhere else on earth that we'd rather meet up than the Mona Lisa. And so yes, we flash back to her grandfather saying, just a little bit further, we're gonna go see the Mona Lisa. And she's like, oh, I'm in a museum, it's after hours. The ceiling is enormous, the floor is dizzying. So even she's referencing the floor. So she's bored, she doesn't care about the Mona Lisa, she wants to go home. And he's like, it's up ahead, it's up ahead in the Salle des Estat room. And so then she's, as a girl, seeing the Mona Lisa, she's not that impressed. And her grandfather's like, what do you think? And she's like, it sucks, it's too small. And he goes, well, you're small and you're beautiful. And then she says, well, her face looks a bit, you know, foggy. And he says, ah, yes, that's a particular style of painting. It's very hard to do. Leonardo da Vinci was really good at it. (sighs) Who gives a shit? Sophie doesn't give a shit. Sophie says, she looks like she knows something, like when kids at school have a secret. And her grandfather's like, ha that's part of why she's so famous. People like to guess why she is smiling. And she goes, do you know why she's smiling? And he goes, maybe someday I'll tell you about it. Princess, life is filled with secrets. You can't learn them all at once. And she's like, oh, just fucking tell me or I'm going home. And he's like, no, I'm not going to tell you. And so that's the end of her flashback, which I think was just there for Dan Brown to explain to us what the Mona Lisa is. Like we can Google it, mate. If we don't know it, we'll Google it. So then Sophie's like, Robert, I'm going back upstairs. I got to go look at the Mona Lisa. And he goes to the Mona Lisa. Like, yes, Robert, catch up. And he's like, what about the embassy? And she's like, yeah, sorry about that. She goes, all right, we'll just go downstairs, follow the exit sign. My car's in the car park. Here's the key. It's a little red smart car. Do you know how to get to the embassy? And he nods because of course he knows how to get to the embassy. He's got a bloody map in his head. 
And how long's it been since they're chasing down that soap in that truck? Like, Fash, it's time to turn back, buddy. Like, they're having full on chats and flashbacks here. You're taking too long. And so Sophie says, listen, I think my grandfather may have left me a message at the Mona Lisa. Some kind of clue as to who killed him or why I'm in danger. I have to go see. And he goes, well, if he wanted to tell you you were in danger, wouldn't he simply write it on the floor where he died? Why did, why this wordle? She says, whatever he's trying to tell me, I don't think he wanted anyone else to hear it. Not even the police. Clearly her grandfather had done everything in his power to send a confidential transmission directly to her. Okay, self-centered much? He had written it in code, included her secret initials and told her to find Robert Langdon, a wise command, considering the American symbologist had deciphered his code. Okay, like anybody could have deciphered that code. You don't need an American symbologist to figure out an anagram. She says, as strange as it may sound, I think he wants me to get to the Mona Lisa before anyone else does. And he's like, all right, well, I'll come with you. And she's like, no, don't, you gotta get out of here. And he's like, come on, I need to. And she's like, please, Mr. Langdon. And he says, call me Robert. And so then she's like, all right, see ya, Robert. So Robert's just leaving. I guess he was like, fuck that. And then he's like, getting to the bottom of the stairs. I thought they were already in the bowels of the Louvre, but they're still going south. And the unmistakable smell of linseed oil and plaster dust assaulted his nostrils. Unmistakable smell of linseed oil. I'm sorry, I I think I could mistake that smell. Is that an unmistakable smell? Uh, uh, I'm not too sure about that. So he's just walking past a room where they restore artworks. Like, okay, great. But I don't know, maybe that smell like triggered something in him and now he's thinking about the Mona Lisa. I mean, I, I think he was already thinking about the Mona Lisa, so I don't know why we're getting the, the smell and, and him looking at an art restoration room. But anyway, now he's thinking, wait a minute, why did Sonia want Sophie to find me if it's just to solve a wordle? Anybody can do that. And also Sophie said that she should have figured out that anagram pretty quickly. So where would my role be in that? What is it that Sonia thinks I know? And then with an unexpected jolt, Langdon stopped short. Eyes wide, he dug in his pocket and yanked out the computer printout. (laughs) You can just say the piece of paper. (laughs) The computer printout. And he stared at the last line of Sonia's message. P.S. Find Robert Langdon. Okay, why do you need to keep referring back to the computer printout? Surely you remember those words because you have like a photographic memory. And also... There's not that many words. Kind of been the focal point of the past hour or so. So yeah, I don't know why you got to keep referring back to it, but apparently he's fixating on two letters, P, S. And in that instant, Langdon felt Sonia's puzzling mix of symbolism fall into stark focus. Everything made perfect sense. His thoughts raced as he tried to assemble the implications. And then he stared back in the direction from which he had come. And he's like, is there time? And he goes, I don't know. And then it says, without hesitation, Langdon broke into a sprint back towards the stairs. I I, I think there was hesitation because he was standing there staring in the other direction. But okay, he's had a brainwave. We're not finding out what the brainwave is, but he's had a brainwave about the letters PS. We thought it meant postscript. Then we thought it meant Princess Sophie. But now I guess it means something else. And I actually don't remember what it means. So that's the end of that chapter. We'll figure that out next week, I guess, because now we're, we're going for our Silas update. Oh, Silas, he's still at the church. He's still at the sans peace. We start chapter 22, he's kneeling down, he's pretending to pray, but he's actually scoping out the joint. And, you know, we've heard a lot about the sans peace, haven't we? Yeah, we got all the backstory in multiple chapters. Um, okay, but I think we need some more. So then Dan Brown tells us, like most churches, sans peace had been built in the shape of a giant Roman cross. Well, I... You did just tell me last time it was built with the same floor plan as the Notre Dame. So while it may be in the shape of a giant cross, that's kind of, that's tangential to the fact that it was modeled off of the Notre Dame. Who gives a shit? So it's got a long section in the middle. It's got an altar up here, a choir pit over there and a coppola over here. And I don't think anyone really cares. So he's looking around, but there he sees Embedded in the gray granite floor, a thin polished strip of brass glistening in the stone, a golden line slanting across the church's floor. So he was just sitting there pretending to pray, scoping out the joint, trying to find this thing. And yet he rejected the tour. He was very nicely and generously offered 
a tour of the church by our beautiful sister Sandrine. She said, are your interests in art or architecture or history? Like, what, what do you want to know about? I'll show you around. And he said, no, bitch, I want to pray in peace. And now he's regretting that because he's probably thinking, I wish I took her up on that tour. But anyway, now he's found what he was looking for. It's this little bit of brass. It's a line apparently straight up and down through the church. And it was like a pagan astronomical device, like a sundial. And it's called the Rose Line. The strip cleaved the communion rail in two, crossed the entire width of the church, finally reaching the corner of the north transept, where it arrived at the base of a most unexpected structure, a colossal Egyptian obelisk. Is it really that unexpected since you pretty much said it was a pagan cathedral before it was turned into a church based off the floor plan of the Notre Dame and also a giant Roman cross? And like, you were trying to find the line, the brass line in the floor, and yet your eye just wasn't immediately drawn to the giant fucking obelisk in the church? You didn't maybe make that your focal point and then look down. Well, uh, the glistening rose line actually took a 90 degree vertical turn up the obelisk, ascended 33 feet to the very tip of the apex where it finally ceased. He was searching around trying to find this line. Uh, apparently it's glistening. <laughs> so then we flash back to him telling the teacher the stories that the people that he killed told about where the bloody thing is hidden or whatever. And so then the teacher's like, <gasps> The rose line, you're talking about the rose line. And so then the teacher quickly told Silas all about the rose line. We're getting an explanation within a flashback. Oh God, I love that. And it was an ancient sundial of sorts. We know it was, it was described as such to us on the previous page, a vestige of the pagan temple that had once stood on this very spot. We know. Oh, So it was known as the Rose Line. And then he goes on to tell us that the symbol of the rose had been associated with maps because apparently the compass, when you divide it all up, it looks like a rose. When you point north, it's a fleur de lis. It goes on for a giant chunk of paragraph, but I don't think anybody cares that much. But the Rose Line used to be the line of zero longitude before it moved to Greenwich. And you're like, okay, that's all right. That's all we need to know. But Dan Brown says, no, we've got to tell you all about when it changed from being in Paris to Greenwich. He says, long before the establishment of Greenwich as the prime meridian, the zero longitude of the entire world had passed directly through Paris and through the church of the Saint-Sulpice. The brass marker in Saint-Sulpice was a memorial to the world's first prime meridian. And although Greenwich had stripped Paris of the honor in 1888, the original rose line was still visible today. Like, oh, okay, great. Okay, so then the teacher said to Silas, and so the legend is true. The Priory Keystone has been said to lie beneath the sign of the rose. Like, okay, if you knew that, why did he have to go and kill five people, including Jacques Sunier in the Louvre? I mean, if you already had the the little hint that it was hidden beneath the sign of the rose, wouldn't you have maybe investigated all the different types of rose landmarks in buildings and artwork and all that bullshit from the time? Like, come on. So then Silas, still fake praying, he's looking around trying to scope out the joint even more so, and he thinks he hears rustling in the choir balcony, but he turns up and gazes up there, but he can't say anything. And he's like, okay, I'm alone. Let's get to work. And then at that moment, Leon, oh God, we've just transported ourselves to Rome. So apparently Bishop Arangarossa, he's landing at Leonardo da Vinci International Airport in Rome. Why Rome? Not too sure. Uh, maybe just because the airport's named after Da Vinci. Anyway, Aaron Garossa, he's just like, here we go. He's like, I've been on the defensive for too long. Tonight, everything will change. Divine intervention. If all went as planned tonight in Paris, Aaron Garossa would soon be in possession of something that would make him the most powerful man in Christendom. And that's the end of the chapter. Just when you think things are moving, we come to a grinding halt with a little Silas chapter, don't we? And I would just once, just once, like to get through a chapter without a flashback or some backstory or a big wall of exposition. It's never going to happen, but I would love it. Anyway, let me know your thoughts. Did you also notice I dropped into the feed the first episode of the Maze Runner content over on Patreon? If you would like to access the rest of the episodes over there, just go to patreon.com slash breaking down bad books. You can access the new content 
For $3 a month, new episodes are dropped every Friday. And thank you to everyone who has left a rating or a review. Anyway, all right, I'll see you guys next week. Au revoir. Send your burning thoughts, frustrations, and grievances on this latest chapter of this shitty book to breakingdownpod at gmail.com or on Twitter at podbreakingdown and Instagram at breakingdownbadbooks. You can visit www.breakingdownbadbooks.com for all the listen links, contact information, merch, and more. To support the show on Patreon and gain access to exclusive ad-free bonus episodes, visit patreon.com slash breakingdownbadbooks. Ratings and reviews on your preferred podcast platform are also a fun, free way to support the show. Breaking Down Bad Books is hosted by me, Nathan Brown, who you can follow on Instagram and Twitter at NathanBrown90. Thanks for listening and happy reading. 